So hello again, everyone. So welcome Net Followers, Net Pals, and welcome Lasse, which is our uh, speaker today. Um, that we will talk, we talk about uh, the growth of a national spending family. So uh, Lasse, the, the room is yours, so please. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um... Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but um, let me get right to it. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so I'm from the Technical University of Denmark, um, and I study networks. And a lot of my recent work has been about uh, family networks, which is something that isn't studied that much, at least not what I've found so far. Um, and this is what I'll be talking about today. And then later I'll talk a bit about some of the thoughts about being a PhD and some of the difficulties that I've faced um, in, I'm about a year in um, and just came back from a half year break where I went and worked with a um, government institution. So it, I've sort of had some time to think about, yeah, what I've done, the choices I've made, but let's go to that later. So, okay, this family thing. So when you think about family networks. So you think about, you have these relations between people, which sort of leads you to think about a network. You often end up thinking about trees. That's because, well, historically we've seen, or we've viewed families as trees. You have like a set of ancestors and then they have kids and have kids and have kids until they have you. Here you see, for example, in the figure, an example of this, where you have, um, I believe it's a German noble from the 1300 um, and his family tree. You could also have the other way around where you would start with uh, one person in the top and then it would branch out and they have kids and they have kids and they have kids. Um, and historically speaking, this has been a way of sort of claiming power um, and trying to, to show that it's it, it valid validated. Because, well, if you can show you have some very important ancestors, then you are probably very important. This goes back to Caesar claiming that he's uh, ancestor of uh, Heracles or Hercules, if you will, and that kind of thing. And this sort of thing still goes on. So, so these family lines are still important. A kind of fun example is that, <laughs> for example, the leader of the North Korea, Kim Jong-un, to this day still claims that he is the descendant of a mountain god. And that's too that his rule over the country and, and why everyone should be subjugated by him. So this kind of thing still goes on. But, um, but we're interested in it from a different perspective, more of a sociological perspective. But all of this is, is kind of uninteresting without some real observations. And what we have is that we have access to parent-child information. That is, we know, uh, we know who had which kid uh, in the country of Denmark small European country that has about 6 million people. And we have that back from the 50s. So that's quite a long time span and quite a lot of people. Um, and when I started working with this, I had this idea that things would be fairly simple, but they were not. So I had my, in my mind, I had the image you see down to your left, uh, if it's not mirrored, where you have this a set of nodes and they have kids and they have kids and they have kids and that sort of results in one person it's very orderly it's very nice but then that's not how reality works it's much more something like this where you really have a complex structure you have like people have kids and with one person and then they have kids with someone else and then the kid has at one point grows up and have a kid with someone from a completely different family so you get this directed network which in many ways goes against the intuition we have as sort of network scientists we're used to having things like a triangle closure that's not here that would that would be kind of weird if you think about what a triangle closure would mean it would mean that you had a kid and then you had a kid with your kid so that doesn't really come up you also don't have power load like you don't have anyone you don't have Degree, like or heavy tail degree distributions because that would imply that someone had like 2,000 kids and there are like some some impressive feats in the data we, we have people with like a dozen kids or more 
but still we don't have anything near like the, the usual skew that we have in degree distribution. You also have this kind of weird structure that for the vast majority of people, you have two parents. If there's not, if there aren't two parents in the data, it's because we didn't we don't know who one of the parents are. It might be migrants who came like who moved to the country and we know that it's it's a mom and her son, but we don't know who the father is, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of complexity, um, but it's not a typical type of network, but still super interesting because it says something about who do you choose to have kids with? That's a massive choice, a really big choice in your life. So we thought, okay, we, we need to get a grasp on this somehow. Where do we start? Well, we're interested in how the network forms over time. That is, how do people choose to have kids with each other? And we thought, let's do the simplest thing to come up with. Okay, we just generate a network by having two nodes, like we have a random assortment of nodes, and we just pick two and they have a kid. That creates a new node. And then we repeat this pairing process completely at random. That might be a good idea, it might not, but it turns out that it's a really bad way of simulating the network. So here in the figure, you have in the darker green, you have the size of the largest connected component uh, over time. So you can see back from, we have data from 63, or 53, sorry. And then this is, what is this? This is like about 20 years. And in that time, we don't really see any big growth in the largest connect component of the actual data. But in our simulated model, which is what you see in the lighter green, we see that all of a sudden, the network just assembles to one massive connected component. And we go from having about 100 to 10,000 nodes, super fast in the large component, much faster than we expect in real life. We have a couple of hypotheses about why this happens. One thing, which is sort of very networky, is that we think it might be due to homophily. So we find in the data, we also have access to um, where people grew up, um, or we have access to what address people lived at, um, and what, like where that address is actually positioned in the country. We also have some information about education and uh, what kind of job people have over time. Um, but right now we're focusing mainly just on location because we found that there's a very clear pattern. For example, here in the figure, I've shown a, um, this is not very, <laughs> not very nice to say, but a conditional log probability of finding a spouse who grew up in a certain area. So this figure reveals that if you came from this small area of Copenhagen, this is a municipality, uh, then the color or the heat map here shows what is the log probability that, you, that your partner grew up in another municipality. The interesting thing is that the municipality itself is by far the brightest. And then you see there is this nice slope in the coloring as you move further away from the municipality. So that means if you grow up somewhere, there's a very high likelihood that you'll find a partner who grew up in the same place. And I, the, our idea is that maybe this could explain why the uh, real largest connect component grows so slowly. Because it is, if everyone is just choosing a partner to have kids with who are from the same neighborhood or from the same small region that they're from, then you don't get these long, these long um, edges that would connect the network. But when you pair things up randomly, you get these long connections and then things just like merge together in one component super fast. So at least that's our, our hypothesis, but it's kind of hard to work with from here. So let's transition from this 2D plot, which is nice in that it shows the geography of the country to something that's one dimensional. So here you see two curves, one of them, is the distance between uh, the centroid of each of the municipalities um, or the distance between the origins of couples. So we looked at each municipality, said, okay, if you, how many people grew up here? And then how many people did uh, their partners, where did they grow up? What's the distance between the centroids of the two municipalities? And then we can simply do a distribution over those, like an empirical distribution, count how many times did we have one distance over the, uh, compared to another? And then we get this blue curve. 
which shows that there's a very high probability that you find a partner who's from the very same municipality that you grew up in. So you, you find a partner who grew up close to you. But there's also something that's a bit wrong in this because, well, if I grew up in, let's say, of the country, then just by the sheer number of people who grew up close to me, I would expect to find a partner who grew up in the same area, just because the population density is different from different regions in the country. So to try to accommodate, accommodate this, we did completely random pairing. We took the data and just made random pairs between people. And then we looked at what kind of distance do you then get? And that's what we see here in the orange, um, in the orange line. It shows that there is a certain probability that you find someone who grew up in the same area as you, but it's actually not that high if you picked partners at random. Um, but we see there is sort of a flattening, of course, and this is uh, the distance in meters once you go above, what is this, 300, 300 kilometers? I think there must be something wrong in the units, but this is about the, like the, largest, like the largest possible range you could go in the country. Um, so that makes sense that it flattens there. But we're not really interested in part selection based on some, like the geography of the country. We want to say, is there a tendency for you to find a partner who grew up close, who grew, uh, grew up in an area where you also grew up? Um, so to do this, we do, we divide, <laughs> we divide this distribution by this distribution. So we divide the distribution of the actual distances with the random distribution or the distribution of random distances. And you get something that looks like this. And that's, it's kind of interesting that it seems to smoothen things out a lot. So what does this plot actually show us? It shows us how much more likely is a person to find a partner who grew up a certain distance from themselves compared to random matching. That is, this shows us people's bias like the geographical bias in selecting partners. And the fun thing is that if you take this distribution and show it in a log log plot, we have this, we have something that looks weird in the start, but then you have this region of very nice, what looks like linear behavior. Of course, this, this could mean many things, but currently we're working towards that there might actually be sort of that the bias that people have might actually have a certain power law structure to it, or at least a very heavy tail structure to it. But then, then why do we see this weird part to the left? Hmm. Well, that might very well be because that, if you recall, then the way we're finding distances is that we look at municipalities, that is a sort of a discrete unit. And then we look at the distances between centroids of municipalities. And these are the distances that we're making. But that means that we have sort of a yardstick. We have a scale. We have enforced a scale that does not necessarily exist. Uh, for example, here I have, you can see that we have actually some quite large distances. These are the centroids of the different municipalities. And the weirdness might be because we've enforced this minimal distance in a way. And maybe if we could go to a more finely granular um, position, then we would get something that's a nicer power law, at least for at least for a bigger range. We don't expect that there's this perfect power law structure because if I grew up in one house and someone grew up in the neighboring house, I don't think I would be more like, I don't think, I think the bias has a smaller limit, so to say. If someone grew up in the house next to me or the house next to that, I don't think that would make a difference, even though there are maybe like 20 meters extra distance to me. So there's probably some range where this sort of rule tampers off. But it's interesting to see if we make something that's more finely granular, whether we see this power law structure better. Um, and that's actually about as far as the project is right now. Currently, we're also trying to bring in things like um, uh, education and labor information. So yeah, so further work changed this idea of centroids for municipalities to actually look at the addresses of people and then, um, and then go back as well and see, okay, we had this generative process, which turned out to be awful, absolutely awful. Could we improve it just by, if we just include things like 
geographical information? Is that enough to actually the Danish family network? If it is, then there might be something, some truth to saying that this is actually the most important sort of selection bias we have. Now, of course, that's also confounded with a lot of things. If I find someone who we likely also have, that might be, we have the same type of education uh, or the same, do have to work in the same kind of, um, same kind of industry or that type of thing. But in itself, these are some very clean results so far, which surprised us, surprised us a lot. Um, so I think that's actually all I want to say about my work. I think I might stop a bit early, but that's all, also always nice. Um, and then to talk about my own experience as a PhD. I don't want to bring slides. I hope that's okay. Um, All right, fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I, I much I think slides always make things a bit informal or formal. Sorry, they make them formal to me, so they feel less personal. And this is very much about my experience. So, when I started my PhD about a year and a half ago, I came out of uh, I came out of university. I was used to just being. One student among maybe 100 or 200 who were in a lecture hall, and there weren't really any kind of expectations for it. Of course, there were expectations of me, but I was very much sort of railroaded. I was told, you have to do this. There are these assignments, and this is how your semester is planned. Okay, I will do that. Then I started as a PhD, and all of a sudden, you have to find out what problems do you want to work on. And then all of a sudden you're interesting in that you can solve other people's problems or you can at least help them with it. So all of a sudden I was presented with an absolute buffet of super nice and interesting questions from the people in my group and people I, other PhDs I chatted with. And I was completely overwhelmed just by the sheer, well, it's a very positive thing, but the sheer amount of nice ideas <laughs> I encountered. And, and they almost left me a bit like paralyzed. And then well, I guess I chose some, but then, but I don't really want to let go of this thing. It seems like a nice idea. This might be a paper as well. So you end up sort of chasing cars, but never really chasing anything for long enough to get something done. Um, and that was very exhausting. Um, and then I tried a bunch of things. I tried like some systems for working more efficiently to get things done faster. Um, I've, I started using getting things done. It's a system. It's very nice. I read a book called Deep Work, um, which is also a very nice book and helps you sort of value your um, intellect, like your the time that you spend on something very focused. But no matter how much I try to sort of make my week effective and set aside blocks to do specific things, and I always found that I just had too many things at once, so I could never get anything done. Um, which was super frustrating. And it just came back to how do, how do you want to prioritize? I found that for me to like, feel good in the process of doing research, I need to prioritize very, very few things. <laughs> so this spring, I'm, I've really practiced trying to say no to more or less every opportunity that comes up. And it seems completely sort of off the rails to me. Um, I'm saying no to conferences. I've been saying no to a bunch of talks. Uh, I've said no to collaborate on some projects. And maybe I'm probably saying no too much this spring. But what I found is that in the first year of my PhD, I said yes to way too many things. So I was way off the balance on one end. Now I'm trying to be on the other end. And then slowly, I hope to converge to something that's nice. Um, but as with anything, I presume it's going to be an ongoing process of how do you value your time? How do you pick good research projects? One thing that helped me a lot was to take a break. Um, I went away from uh, university for six months to work uh, as an, kind of as an intern, just as an employee in a research group in the state department. That was very nice. And then I felt I realized when I came back that a lot of things were clearer to me. It was easier to pick what was important and what seemed like a good idea and what wasn't important. Not that I've spent a lot of time while I was away thinking about these things. They just sort of slowly settled themselves, which was very nice. It was a very good experience. Um, so maybe maybe the, the way forward for me is to 
do something similar, take some breaks here and there, go and work somewhere else in a university and then come back um, and see if things are clearer. But again, again, that's just my experience and you might be in a completely different scenario. So yeah, take it for what it is. Uh, I think that's all I had prepared. Thank you, Lars. I think it's it's really nice to thank you for the talk. Uh, first. And I want to say something, but uh, then we can ask to the audience if there are some questions and and other comments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At first, I, I want to say that I truly believe that th this kind of being overwhelmed by by all the things you have to do doing PhD is something that I can totally relate with. So yeah. I, I agree in the yeah. sense, I, I really, I really enjoy the fact that you say uh, you have to, to, to say no sometimes to, to, to all these yeah. possibilities, because also in the silence, if you want, you can find something. So sometimes yeah. that, sure. that's important. Sure. And there but, is a weird thing in that all the things you are, be in a situation where you're forced to do a bunch of things which you find really annoying or it could be a bunch of meetings and, and all i also had that but i could manage that the, the difficult thing for me was was really sort of the tantalizing nice ideas that someone said like oh yeah this is i think this has some potential but then if a million things have potential then well, what do you do <laughs> i don't know yeah i think that was really it's still really difficult yeah there are some, is there any question about the, the research, for example, if we want to, we can also go back to that a bit before mm -hmm. going on yeah. the, I don't know if someone has some curiosities. Uh, I have a, one comment or question mm -hmm. about the research part. So the, the distance measured is a distance where the, uh, person was born right yeah that's a good that's actually i don't think i clarified that where very well so we look at we look at where people lived in their first 20 years okay. and then find is there a municipality where they spent uh, a lot like more than half of that time um, and it turns out that that was that most people like live in a fairly restricted area um, oh, okay so it's it's not just where you're born because when we look at when people move, there's actually a really big sort of in the like frequency. Then you can look at when people are just born, there's a very high frequency of moving. And then it settles down until they turn 18, 20 years old and they start moving out themselves. So childhood, like from your two years old or something like that, that's super stable when it comes to at least where you lived. Okay. So the idea is that um, uh, you would uh more be more probable to choose a partner where live not too far from you yep. in the her childhood or his childhood. Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay. Is, which is kind of odd. And one thing that we currently looking into is also if you grew up near to each other, but then moved to the other end of the country, do you then still find each other? Is it is it that simple? Are people that sort of <laughs> set in their ways that I can only I can only get together with someone who understands like my childhood experience but so far that's what we're seeing it's it's, it's really weird oh, it's, it's, very, it's really interesting yeah thanks and that's a very interesting argument because there are in the mighty two perspectives when you choose a partner because for example if you um, move away from where you're born and where you live when you're childhood like mm -hmm. where, where, where i am now Mm -hmm. uh so you you will definitely choose a partner at the age of choosing a partner uh mm -hmm. at, at a near location at where are you right now right it is basically not possible to for now you choose a partner like uh, ten thousand kilometers away from you oh yeah, yeah. there's something and about this is, meet the person yeah 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 this is one perspective and the other perspective is also from your talk it's a childhood like experience if you grow up in a similar mm -hmm. location and you may have more similarities so yeah, this two roles may both play. I mean, this two factors may both play a role in the decision uh, or the choosing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Process. So that's yeah, that's interesting. And that's also what we try to do, sort of with the 
if again with the at the, the idea of saying we take the the distribution of how people actually moved and then divide mm -hmm. it by distribution if people moved at random because then you would sort of get then it sort of reveals that if you just have a representative sort of selection of the country without sort of taking into consideration who you might be close to who would you then choose so it is sort mm -hmm. of trying to, we're trying to untangle these things as, as you say and this it is quite interesting yeah, that's very interesting thank you um there is a question from Yermo. You can unmute yourself. Um, hello, hi. Hi. Great. Yeah, th thanks for the talk. Oh, that was interesting. Yeah, the, it was also follow following up from from what the Hanlin mentioned. Like, yeah, the idea. I mean, the first idea of mobility. Like, indeed, it's it's well, it's interesting that then you move to somewhere else, and then you you choose to marry with someone that is from the same original place, which I mean makes makes sense. But also, I was thinking like it's there is probably also potentially big differences between urban and rural uh, behaviors and this is something like like probably it would also be interesting to to separate the analysis and see if there are major differences there mm -hmm. also because uh, as you say like okay if you move a random around the the country then but probably the movement are more typically from rural areas to urban areas at Where the colors, <laughs> where the color slowly goes down, so to say, the color slowly goes darker. Right. That is, they have sort of a longer reach. When you're from a bigger city, it seems that you find a partner who grew up further away. And yeah. if you look at the municipalities that are very rural, they find mostly someone from the same municipality. So you could say, what's the problem? If you look at the the odds or the, the probabilities of a person growing up, and they find someone from the same municipality. That they grew up in those are by far the biggest when you go to like super rural areas of the country which is kind of i don't know it was a little counterintuitive to me because i expected saying if i grew up like in the middle of nowhere it's just me and my family and 20 kilometers to the next house you would imagine that i would have to i don't know go further to meet someone hmm. and and i would sort of be that you could imagine that people would choose like among the nearest I don't know, a thousand available singles or something like that. It seems weird to say, but like am amongst the nearest thousand people and say, okay, I find a partner there. But that would mean that if you're a rural area, you should have a longer reach, but it's the opposite we're seeing. So there really is something about cultural yeah. barriers that we see here. But I, I was thinking again, like, because maybe if, if rural people tend to go to the city, then, then I guess, I, I wonder if like this, yeah, like, then people from cities like are more in a mixed environment from everywhere else, even mm. if they remain in the city and they are the yeah. urban people. And that is but the, people move to the bigger cities. We know that for sure. Also in also in Denmark. Um, yeah. And and there are but there's also then there's also some confounders in saying, okay, um, what if your parents had a university degree? let's say that, and you grew up in the rural areas, then you would have a higher likelihood to go to university, but you would also have some sort of social capital that you bring with you because you grew up in a home where people had already gone to university. Hmm. And then you might be more likely to find a partner in your, like at the university in the city. So, so there, really, there are really a lot of effects going at once here. Right. And it's quite fun to sort of try and model it into a network process. Um, Mm -hmm. oh, nice. So you have also all that data as well? Yes. I mean, uh, you have a lot is, of social demographic? Or, yeah, or? So, so we have a lot of social demographic data. Um, nice. it's, it is the, it's a collaboration with the, the Statistical Bureau of Denmark. And for hmm. some reason, Denmark has a long history of just keeping tabs on what people have been doing. Um, it's the same in Sweden and in the Netherlands. There's just been a long history of sort of cataloging okay this person finished that degree on this day okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, and that's what we're using here 
So great. Well, thanks for the question. Nice for network scientists. <laughs> No, yes, yes. <laughs> I, think, I think really useful for a lot of scientists. Yes, quite an, yeah, quite remarkable. Um, we have another question from Gabriele. Yeah. So, um, yes. Um, so I had one comment on research and the other one on the discussion. So first on the research. Um, so also following all this discussion. So the first thing first is. Um, so you have also data about like the movement that they had, like where they be. Okay. So one thing is where they grew up, but I was also wondering like how this behavior of choosing someone from your same area, uh, apart from the things that especially Guillermo was, was saying, also like how this changes with the distance from where you used to live to where you used to live in, like you've been living most in the last, I don't know, five years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of, yeah. So this is the, the first thing that I don't know if you checked and if you have such a data, because also like maybe you find someone and then you marry the person and then you live together. So of course you live in the mm -hmm. same place where the other person is because you're living together. <laughs> so it, it, it's more like, five years before they started living together or yeah. whatever. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? Because I was curious. But, yeah, but we could do that. So so we have information about how people change address. That, so how they move in the service. Mm. Um, and you could definitely do it uh, to go and see, okay, when there are couples, where did they grow? If they're at, currently living on the same address, what was their previous address? You could, you could yeah you could certainly do something okay. like that. we haven't tried it it's a good question um because it is this so so there is this thing of saying you have certain people that you meet because they're close sort of similar to what we, we talked yeah. about in the earlier question and then there's this thing that you select certain people among the ones you know like the ones you meet um, exactly that's the, that's exactly why i was thinking on this because maybe if the effect is still there then maybe you're selective but yeah. if it's just if it's diminishing, then maybe you're. It's just a. I don't know. You didn't move too much, so yeah. in the end, yeah. you're meeting people from the same place. I mean, that's okay. There is one thing we did investigate, was that because we can also look at how people moved, mm -hmm. then we also looked at let's say that you live in a certain municipality. How then? How do you move between municipalities? What's the probability that you move to uh -huh. from the capital to some other city or some other municipality? And what we found there was that it's easier to move far away than it is to find a partner who's far away. So there's something more than just you moving there and then you find a partner. Okay. Your sort of the distribution of partner selection has more weight in the municipality you grew up in, in like in general. Um, so there is something in, there is this interesting interplay in how you move and how you find a partner. Yeah, exactly. Um, the way you say. Thank you. Um, so this was for the for the first part. Mm -hmm. For the second uh, part was more towards the discussion yep. because um, so it's a, a very fresh thing. Like uh, the one of the last meetings with my supervisor. So I'm and uh, doing like I'm writing the thesis. I should submit in a yep. month if I manage anyway. Okay. And yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> and anyway, so I was speaking with my supervisor and he was like, yeah, yeah, but the problem is like, we could have done this because it would have been like the perfect conclusion of your thesis, okay? And, but yeah, it's like you spent a long time in this other project, which is very unrelated to, to the things you've done, uh, but I really wanted to do it um because also it was a very nice project in my opinion but then it in the end i spent too much time doing it like more much more than i than i than i thought and so yeah it's very it's very complicated uh as you say to choose and i still haven't found a solution but oh, okay. i can see your no it's just a comment to to give my experience as well because yep. it's so relatable i think every one of us is doing this and um i've been thinking also on like since i'm about to finish i don't know if you can relate 
but like when you 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 see like okay what i want to be in 10 years so you say okay maybe if i want to pursue an academic position then what i see is like what my supervisor is and how the my colleagues that are more senior are and i see that the way they work is like they have like so many things to do mm. and it's not just something that we have um it's also something that they are also experiencing and and i don't know if it's something that you, if you want to be successful in what you do like you have to cope with the fact that you're going to have to do a lot of things and maybe work extra hours or it's something that that we've been thinking as well in other uh, the seminar discussions also uh, like yeah but like how should we also like have this balance between work and uh, and your life because i mean if we do too many things and then you have to do them because maybe you have too many projects you have too much teaching to do and then you have to do them i mean it's not that you you cannot say no so i don't know this is some I'm, I'm bringing more to the discussion that i've been seeing with my experience i, I don't have any a solution it's just a comment i don't know if you uh, you guys any of you have anything to add on this i don't know yeah yeah i i, I get you i totally get your point especially about seeing that well if you look at your colleagues and your supervisor and so a lot of them are doing the same thing um I do have, I do, but I do, actually, I have two supervisors and I can see there's a pretty big difference between them as well. Of course, they both do a lot of things and, but one of them seems to balance it a lot more. Like one of them, uh, that's also the way he works. It's just like, if I as like send him a, an email at 11 at night, yeah, he'll answer. <laughs> the other one takes sort of, it seems to be more protective about his time. So I can see there are like, there is some wiggle room in how you do it. Both are like fairly successful, pretty successful. So, so there's some wiggle room in how you do it, and there's a big, I guess there would also be a big bias in who you see, because mm -hmm. they would also influence yeah. each other and work in similar ways. Um, that could but be. you might be right. Sorry. No, no, I was, I was agreeing. Um, I was also, I want also to read uh, from the chat because Federica has to leave, but mm. I want to. Read, um her thought uh, she's saying guys i'm very sorry but i have to to leave i wanted to say that the talk was really interesting regarding the final part of the talk i would like to add that last sebastian get told the story of my phd so thank you for making this point out see you <laughs> so yeah we uh, feel the same i think <laughs> so oh alin are you what do you want to yeah say? i just want to com comment <laughs> so what Gabriele has said is basically quite related to some like mental health for early research, <laughs> early researchers, <laughs> which is a very good discussion for this uh, seminar. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so I have some like my, my experience to share is quite uh, similar, but it's only happened recently uh, because uh, um, so for the project selecting, uh, because uh, my supervisor in the very, like first three years of my PhD, uh, she like advised a lot, like which project uh, is good to choose or which project to maybe not work on. So at uh, as very first two or three years, I'm mainly working on at the same time working on one main project. So it went on pretty smooth. I just focus all my energy to that project and try to solve the detailed issues etc and now in my last year it things becomes a little bit different because now there are several actually three projects i'm currently working on one of my main focus the other two are more related to a collaboration with other groups from other countries and meantime like i have teaching i have um, uh, other things and i need to work on my thesis etc so uh, there are indeed a lot of things to do. And at the meantime, actually, I really, at this time, I'm, as Gabrielle was saying, I'm really looking at other people, like the supervisor, what she's doing. And I noticed definitely she's much more, 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 more busier than I am now. Like uh, apart from the project we're working on, she also participated and she has other publications, other projects working on. 
and some teaching, like applying for things and being a reviewer, whatever this academic um, uh, activities. So it seems a lot of things to do, uh, which really make me think how I should um, cope with this type of thing because uh, I'm thinking this is indeed will be a general issue because during your PhD, you're a student. So basically you are uh, working on a certain project and you are carry out all, I mean, uh, a main, a lot of the details work like doing calculation or whatever. But if you want to find a job in academia or if you become a professor in the end, you may not work in all the details like doing derivation and writing codes, but you may control overall uh, on many projects at the same time. You need to comment on, if you have students, you need to comment what they are doing, if uh, what your your advice on them and etc. So these, I think, it, will requ require a lot of like multitasking ability. Yes, yeah, so I indeed feel this is now happening to me and I'm trying to find a way of coping with this multitasking <laughs> yeah. thing. I mean, not for supervising people, but uh, many things show up, so yeah. <laughs> So there was ah, Lisa. Also Lisa, yes. But thank you very much for, for the talk and the, the experience. Like uh, I can really relate as all of you. <laughs> and I, I want especially to comment on the part of, of the two supervisor because I have the same situation. <laughs> like I have two supervisor and one seems super uh, busy all the time. I, we can only make like one hour meeting because then he has another things. Uh, and I and I see yeah, I'm, I I'm not able to do that. <laughs> I can do I can I can do that. Uh, but then the other is completely relaxed. But they are basically the same. I mean, uh, in terms of publishing or in terms of um, teaching and stuff. They are in family also because you have to cope with family as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I think I'm. I mean, it gives me hope because with also with different um, like profile, you can you can still reach a, a position in academia, but you just have to yeah maybe learn how to uh, what is your limit, what is your uh, also. How to mentally deal with it? Uh, okay, I'm very, I'm very busy. Uh, I don't get stressed. Maybe I do one thing at a time, or uh, maybe some other people are more uh, good at doing all the things at at a time. It, it, it is possible. I mean, uh, yeah. I'm not. Yeah. And, and so there is, they, if they are your supervisors and they're like living researchers. That means mm -hmm. that they, they, they're like their system is 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 balanced. So maybe the, the, the busy uh, mm -hmm. supervisor is like that. So for, yeah. for him or her or they is totally fine to do research like that. So and may I ask who is your second supervisor? Uh, Lucas? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's super shit. <laughs> I, I, I feel he's quite relaxed. I was the, his nope. uh, PA in the first year, and after the, I, like I remember, like this was first, uh, first uh, TA session of the semester, and he was there, like guiding us how we should do it. And in the end, he said, "I need to run. I need, I need to pick up my daughter." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there are some who just managed to go with the super yeah. vibe, and I don't know. Uh, they might be the most important people to 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 talk to and ask how do you do it <laughs> <laughs> tell well, me maybe, secrets <laughs> yeah, maybe the solution is try to find yourself that that seems very philosophical but uh, try <laughs> to find what, what works for you hmm. what's your, your your perfect, well, yeah, perfect also... possible but what's your um, preference yeah yeah I mean, also with the the whole the pro the, the 
tons of projects at the beginning. I was in the same situation as well. Like I, I was going to conference, each conference I was speaking to a person and then <laughs> a project came out. Like it was crazy for me. I <laughs> uh, I went to five conference, five projects. No. <laughs> yeah. So at some time I had to cut off on what is, what is really important. And then maybe postponing the, well, it was for me an, an experience and a way to maybe uh, try to choose what I want to do after what I'm doing right now. Yes, definitely. Also with Sylvia, we we <laughs> we could, we talked about the project. Yes. And, and at some, some point we will do that. We will do that. As some, uh, like sometimes it comes to my mind. Oh, then Sylvia, we had to talk. <laughs> but yes, we call and we will next conference. Yeah, I, I, I think I suppose I want to add something else, like uh, the fact that you can only work on, I guess everyone can only work like, I don't know, maximum two main projects where he's like the leader was actually doing all the work, you know, like if you're the one to do like at the same time, I mean, you can stop one project and then do another. So, I mean, that doesn't come, but I mean, at the same time, but you have a limit and I suppose it's very, very small. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's that's what I'm trying to do now, at least. Like, if, for example, there was, I had a research visit somewhere uh, in Rome and a project came out. I mean, they were already doing something and uh, they asked me like what I was thinking because of my experience with some of the things they were doing. Um, and so I started to collaborate with them on this project, but like I, I already knew that I was already leading three other projects. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna just deal like with this, like maybe one hour every week. So it just like I have a meeting or like give, then maybe once I will have finished those other projects, maybe I will spend more time on this. And that's I think what seniors do as well. Like they, even like my supervisor is not anymore doing any work done. It's all uh, us doing everything. So if you don't have any projects that you are actually doing, then your main project becomes teaching one when you have a lot of teaching and then becomes applying to a grant when it becomes there. But you don't really do any more real work. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's why you start having PhDs, like get the things done for you. No? Um, so I don't know, I, I see it this way and uh, probably this way it works because I mean, you can have 10 projects but you're actually working on two. Those other 10, they may, might just add up to one day for in your, on your whole week. Then two days and two days are, are for your other two projects uh, that you lead, like really, and not as a supervisor which leads, uh, you know you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I, I get what you, the distinction you make for sure. I don't know if you agree, but I start with my experience. I so at least for me, it worked. Like I don't, I see this only option, and that's the way forward. Otherwise, you cannot. Do it. Yeah, yeah, but it also just requires a lot of discipline to 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 not <laughs> sort of deep dive into any of the other projects. Then, but yeah, I, I guess that might work. That might be the way forward. Or maybe oscillating as last year, as the last experience, maybe. For a, for, for a period be very like uh, into and then have a like a yeah. break. Okay, I don't want to do anything. Yeah. I want to only yeah. work on, on this. Yeah, I know, so. some, I know some people who do all their teaching in the fall semester and then they oh. just have, like try to get rid of everything during the spring. So they that, sort of have like two two jobs that they- That's interesting. That's in. interesting because you can focus on one part and then the other part and be very yeah. effective yeah you just one part you're just nice. a teacher the other part you're just a researcher nice yeah there might be a way to do it i think that my supervisors has kind of did this for this year in fact yeah. that now is is working in on on his research and also with me so uh but the first semester was was difficult was different and difficult because it was teaching i was teaching so <laughs> Yeah, the time was not so much, but yeah, it's it's good to have only like to be focused only on 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 a mm. thing. And then, if I can add one more thing, it was it just came out again. Like like, like there was two other projects came out as a conference, as you were saying before. And what I decided then, because of these reasons, was like okay, 
I'm gonna, let's decide now that we're gonna meet one week together and do most of the work there in that week. Wow. We're all gonna do only that. And yeah. I think this works. Like I've done this already once and like basically we have done more in that week than in six months later. And like basically now it's been, like, it's been a little bit more than what we did, but most of the things were done there. Uh, I think maybe this could work when there is no clear leading, then they, we are like all the same level, and, but we all have to contribute it. That maybe that works, I don't know, an idea. Yeah, I feel, I feel a bit the same. I feel like if you are leading and doing all the work, it's, it's very hard to split yourself in two different things. Like for me, it happened. I, I, I started a, a postdoc before finishing the PhD, writing up, and that didn't turn out very well. It was like, <laughs> I was working, new postdoc, new field, uh, a lot of new things, my mind completely in, and then weekends going to write the thesis, that is a huge thing as well. <laughs> so it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a good idea, I mean, now, now I see like, okay, now I, I tell everyone, like, don't, don't do that, you can push the, the postdoc to start or something. And, and now well, I, I have the, the corrections still left, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, one, two weeks and work on the corrections fully, and then back because I think it's much better, no. especially if you are doing all the work and it's a big thing that you have a, a lot of to think to put your mind a lot in, in it. No. Uh, but the, yeah, what you say also, I had a, also another project with a, with a close friend, and also like we meet every for this every once every half a year, and then we say okay, we spend a few days together like full. I mean, it's a very close friend as well. So we we he comes to my house, everything will stay, and then we we go like fully nice. on that. And, and yeah, it, it really works that that way much better because then you have so many things, and your mind is in so many places that really doing work more like in depth is hard. It's exactly the same. Mm. Yeah, I can feel you. Is there any comment question? I, I can say that I need to leave in about two minutes. Perfect. Um, yep. If there are no more questions or comments, we can end this session. Very, very nice. Thank you, Lasse, uh, because we had a tons of time to talk and discuss. That's the core of NetPlay. So thank you very much for, for, for sharing your experience and talk with us. Thanks a lot. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. And yeah, nice to mm. meet you. Nice to see you again. And hopefully and we will see you again uh, yeah, some other time. somewhere. Okay. Okay. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Good to see you.